Okay, so I think we'll start uh, five minutes early because Cheryl is there. Um, I think probably everyone's here. So um, we're very, very happy to have, she was supposed to be here, but she's mm -hmm. here so far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so it's, we're very, very happy to have her give this first talk. And I'm sure we'll be one for, well, all of her talks are good. And it's about the questions of permutation groups. Go ahead, Cheryl. Thank you, Donna and Rebecca and my apologies for not for not being there with you in person. I am so sorry. Um, but it's a bit scary traveling with COVID. <laughs> so um, this is the permutation groups day, isn't it? And so my my lecture is supposed to be some kind of introduction. And um, here's what I'm going to try to do. I'll spend some time talking about what should be the basic kinds of permutation groups, what tools we've got to work with them. And I'll look at I'll be looking at finite ones so that maybe we'll be able to use the finite simple group classification. And then look at a few different kinds of questions that have been answered or that we try to answer or that we might try to answer in the future. But let's just see how we go. So um to start off with, we'll have a set that we're acting on. And if it's finite, let's say it's the numbers one up to n, or it might at the beginning be infinite, but I'll tell you when that becomes a problem with this story. So we're interested in permutation groups on omega. So they're just the subgroups of the symmetric group of all permutations, sim omega. Usually we'll take the group to be transitive. So for all two points in omega, there will be at least one permutation in G that takes the first point alpha to the second point beta. If it's not transitive, there's ways of reducing. And it, one important question we might next ask is, does G preserve a non-trivial partition of omega? And by that, I mean that we will take the set omega, this blue bit down here, we'll divide it up into blocks and um, to preserve that partition, every element of this group G has to permute around the parts sort of part-wise or block-wise. When this happens, then we can embed, there's a, a, a universal sort of embedding theorem that says we can embed in a wreath product of two smaller transitive permutation groups. And the first one, the K1, is the group that um, the subgroup stabilizing one of these blocks induces on it. So a transitive group there. The second one is the group of permutations of the set of blocks. So we'll get smaller transitive groups this way and we keep going. So if we repeat, if it's a finite set, we repeat a finite number of times until it's impossible to repeat anymore. And at the end of this, we will get our group G embedded in um, an iterated wreath product. And you notice I don't use any brackets anywhere because in fact, we don't need to. Um, this, this is sort of a transitive relationship here. And so each of these Ks, these smaller transitive groups, they're transitive, but they preserve only the trivial point partitions. That's a partition where either all the parts have got size one or there's only one part. And such groups, such transitive groups are called primitive, and they are traditionally the basic kinds of primitive groups. Now, this story works for some families of infinite permutation groups, but you often need some kind of finiteness condition. So for the rest of my talk, I'm really going to be talking about finite groups. Okay, so traditionally primitive groups are the basic ones, but it's not the only possible story I could have been telling. I could have changed that important question about transitive groups into this one. Here's an alternative question. We could have said, does the group G have a non-trivial normal subgroup N that's intransitive, not transitive on omega? If that answer was yes, then the set of N orbits is um, a G invariant partition and we would get um, an embedding um, G into K1, wreath K2, just as we did before. 
and we could keep on asking this question um, does do um, k1 or k2 have non-trivial intransitive normal subgroups and if we keep on and on and get an iterated reach product embedding here g contained in one of these and this time each of the ki has no non-trivial intransitive normal subgroup all its normal non-trivial normal subgroups are transitive and that's what's called quasi-primitive and in fact both of these concepts could equally well be chosen as the basic permutation groups that we might consider so primitive ones are traditional quasi-primitive um, the, in fact, there's lots of stories about this, but let me go on. There are tools for working with these basic permutation groups, whether or not it's the primitive or the quasi-primitive ones we're looking at. So we have these structure theorems, and they tend to identify different types of either primitive or quasi-primitive groups. And the object is to partition the set of basic groups, primitive or quasi-primitive, um, and a broad brush description of this um, partitioning of the set is that we usually define them up into affine ones, almost simple ones, diagonal ones, and then there's some kind of product construction. And this kind of um, broad brush description was first used by Peter Cameron. And it gives you a pretty good feeling, but covers over a few, few questions. So I wanted to just give you an idea of the timeline for this. Um, some people would say that this idea of dividing up these primitive groups goes back to the 1870s in Jordan, Camille Jordan's treatise on, on groups. Um, around, certainly around the 1960s, there were hints of it. And in fact, recently I had to dig through Peter Neumann's thesis and some parts of it which were never published give um, explicit constructions for some of the diagonal groups. And it's the earliest, earliest place I know where they appear. And um, a, a colleague of Reinhold Baer's was telling me that Baer in the 60s had ideas of this division, but it was 1979 at the Santa Cruz Conference on Finite Groups where two mathematicians, Michael Onan and Leonard Scott each brought manuscripts containing what we now think of as the Onan-Scott theorem for dividing up and identifying different kinds of primitive permutation groups. And I guess it's well known that sometimes we think of the Onan-Scott theorem this way, and sometimes we think of it as just identifying the maximal um, subgroups of the symmetric group in some sense. Um, but there was a little glitch in the first statement of the Onan-Scott theorem. It was only published by Leonard Scott because Michael withdrew his manuscript, but I've seen several copies of it beautifully written. Anyway, there was this glitch and two different um, sets of people tried to, to um, correct the statement. So there's one paper by Ashbacher and Scott in 85. And there's another paper by Kovac in 86, both written independently, both um, correct this little glitch and it's got something to do with a twisted wreath type of primitive permutation group. And then there's um, another paper in 88 written by Martin and Jan and myself, which gives a self-contained proof and a little bit more information about the twisted wreath case. As far as quasi-primitive groups go, there's a very similar structure theorem for quasi-primitive groups that dates from 1992. And um, if anyone's interested in this deal about Ashbacher, Scott and Kovach, there's an analysis and a comparison about what they prove um, made by Chuba Schneider and myself when we were writing about Lotzi Kovach's work on permutation groups. And there's... Um, a good summary of all the different possible statements and subdivisions um, of the Onan Scott theorem in both versions, primitive, quasi primitive, in, in um, Chubbers and my book published in 2018. So they're the basic ones. So the purpose, really, in, in the way I'm thinking of it today, is the purpose of this, these theorems is to somehow highlight how to apply the finite simple group classification. 
to finite basic groups. So for the affine type, um, you'll identify the set with a finite vector space and the group G with the um, translation group, semi-direct product, some irreducible group of linear transformations of the space. So it's bringing in representation theory into describing um, permutation groups. The, the second kind of group is the almost simple group. So the SOCL is just a non-abelian simple group T. Not much geometry in general you can use there, but these are really important. And of course, you're going to use the finite simple group classification looking at those groups. The diagonal one is, well, what is it? The, you've got a SOCL being a direct product of K copies of some non-abelian simple group T, K has got to be bigger than one, and it's called diagonal because the point stabilizer in, the, in N is a diagonal subgroup of T to the K. And then the product type, which I talked about, was just um, giving a way of taking G as a subgroup of a wreath product, but this time in product action, so that the set is a Cartesian power of a smaller set gamma. So omega is T to the K. And the action here is going to be primitive. Or in the quasi-primitive structure theorems, the gamma to the K might be the label of a canonical invariant partition. So what's new about all this thing? There is one thing I did want to advertise and tell you about because I'm so excited about it. In the diagonal case, it used to be thought that you say, yeah, sure, the SOCL is a direct product of isomorphic non-abelian simple groups. So you've got a simple group there. So of course, you're going to use simple group theory to describe them, but you don't tend to. And it seemed to be a bit anomalous. The affine case, you had um, a geometry, affine geometry, the product type, you used Cartesian decompositions and the theory there to help you along, to reduce you a little bit further. But the diagonal, there wasn't a very good understanding of it. So if this number K was two, oh, oh sorry. So what, what do I do? I've got this um, stabilizer being a diagonal subgroup of T to the K. So if we use a sort of um, coset action, at least as far as the Sockle is concerned, but this can be extended. You can think of the set omega as being identified with t to the k minus one. And if k is two, then you're identifying omega with a copy of the simple group, the non abelian simple group t. And this was well known that you could understand the action. The group g was contained in a semi direct product of this normal subgroup n acting by right multiplication extended by the automorphism groups, just acting naturally. That was well known. But, but as soon as K was at least three, there wasn't any nice geometry going on. And this is what we now have. So if K equals three, we have omega being T squared. And I would like you to think of T squared as being a grid. And you um, think of it maybe as being the Cayley table, the multiplication table for the group T. And when you do this, then your group G is contained in the automorphism group of this Latin square. And if K is at least four, then there is a higher dimensional version of this, which we introduce called a, a diagonal geometry or a diagonal semi-lattice of partitions of of this, this higher dimensional grid, T to the K minus one. Now we can define these diagonal geometries by axioms. And just like with a projective geometry, if you're talking about projective planes, there's a whole lot of different sorts of projective planes. But once your dimension is higher than, a, higher than two, all of the projective geometries are dysarxian. The same thing sort of happens here. For um, k equals two, the smaller, sorry, k equals three, the smallest um, dimension here, there are many, many sorts of Latin squares, not all based on groups. But as long as k is at least four, then all of the geometries come from a special group structure, group construction. And if anyone is actually interested in this, um, our paper by Rosemary Bailey, Peter Cameron, Chubba Schneider, and I has 
only in the last few weeks been published by the Transactions of the American Math Society. And I hope that it's going to make um, things much more easy for using geometry and, uh, you know, a, a combinatorics in, in, in studying these sorts of groups as well, so that we'll have a genuine um, reduction to being able to use uh, finite simple group classification. So this is supposed to be about um, answering big questions. How did this all come about and what were the questions? Well, in 1980, there was a perhaps too early, uh, what is it called? <laughs> well, anyway, the finite simple group classification was announced and some big questions were answered immediately involving primitive groups because everyone was expecting this announcement to happen at some point. So first off, there was the classification of the two transitive groups, the groups which are transitive on ordered pairs of distinct points. Um, this was written up in a, a paper in 1980 itself by Peter Cameron, and the affine ones were really finishing off the work of Christoph Herring, who was working towards this and just needed to finish the last bits once you knew that there weren't any more simple groups coming along. This was extended to primitive rank three groups. So there, the, the groups are rank three. If you, if you stabilize a point and the stabilizer has that point and just two more orbits, so exactly three orbits on the points. So the primitive rank three groups were classified in two papers by um, Martin Liebeck and Jan Satzel. And there were other sorts of, of um, classifications a few just a few years later classifications of primitive groups of odd degree where the number of points was odd this again I think was um, independently um, proved by in a paper by Liebeck and Saxel and in a paper by Cantor and as, as well as this so some of those you we might have expected them to happen but then there were some other rather surprising results. And one of these is my favorite. There are others that I could have chosen, but this one's my favorite. 1982, there was a paper by Peter Cameron, Peter Neumann, and at the time, MSc student, David Teague. And that says for almost all N, the only primitive subgroups of SN are SN itself and the alternating group AN. So, for the numbers where there are other kinds of primitive groups, they've got density zero in the number line. And so you might ask, well, what about quasi-primitive groups? There are similar big questions answered, and they're much later, because nothing was known much about primitive quasi-primitive groups until much later. So for example, we do now know all of the quasi-primitive rank three groups, and that's um, published in 2011. And, um, and this last question, we do know that for almost all N, the only quasi-primitive subgroups of SN are SN and AN. And that is a paper by myself with Anish Shalev and number, theory, number theorist um, Roger Heath-Brown. Because as Anna and I were working on this, um, we discovered there was a a number theory problem that we didn't know how to solve. And so we enlisted Roger's help. And so now that's published in 2005. So that's like um, an introductory set of questions that were answered using essentially the Onan Scott theorem to reduce down to finite simple groups and then use information about the finite simple groups to help finish off the answer. So there are many, many applications. Um, and I hope someone will let me know if I'm running out of time or something. Um, there, are, there are many applications. It, these could be in algebra, in number theory, in geometry or combinatorics. Um, and the problem is how can we reduce these problems to the basic cases? And how do we decide whether the primitive or the quasi-primitive um, are the appropriate basic groups to look for. Of course, the primitive ones are more readily understood. And what if we can't reduce them like that? Are there other tools that we would be able to use? And, and even if we could reduce them, what if we 
don't know enough about the finite simple groups to be able to, to finish it off. Well, let's look at a few examples. I actually want to tell you a story because, um, well, first it involved me. And secondly, this is where the quasi-primitive groups came from. And in a way, it's a little parable about don't be surprised if things don't happen the way you would like them to. Um, so this is about how quasi-primitive groups became important. It's all about symmetry of graphs. We were studying two arc transitive graphs. These graphs were studied way back in the 40s and the 50s by, by Tut. Um, what do I mean? So a two arc in a graph is a triple of vertices, alpha, beta, gamma, and the first two, alpha and beta, are an edge. The second two, beta and gamma, is an edge, and alpha and beta are distinct. So you've got two. So a two arc looks a bit like these red double lines down here. And two arc transitive means that the group of automorphisms of the graph is transitive on the set of two arcs. Now, here is a theorem that Babai, Lotzi Babai, famous for graph um, complexity of graph automorph isomorphism, uh, but in 1985, he proved this theorem. He said, each regular graph has a two arc transitive cover. Now, that's got a few um, words that you might or might not understand. So, for a graph, regular means that the vertices have the same valency. Each vertex is joined to the same number of other vertices. And here is a fact which um, might say something about <laughs> why this is a surprising result. Most regular graphs have only the trivial automorphism group. They don't have any non-trivial automorphisms. Whereas two arc transitive graphs have lots and lots of symmetry. So what he's saying here is something about this one, have a two arc transitive cover. So what does that mean? It means you take this bottom line here, you've got your graph. And above every vertex, you blow it up into a constant number of other vertices like that. And um, as far as the edges go, wherever you see an edge in your original graph, up here, you're going to match up the vertices between these two little balloons and draw an edge. So you're going to have a what's called a perfect matching. So um, if you had each vertex joined to say three other vertices down in gamma, it would still be joined to three other vertices up here. So you're still getting a regular graph. And Baba is saying, uh, oh, uh, and doing this process, what I said, blowing it up in a constant number of vertices, drawing this perfect matching, it says that this bigger graph is a cover of the smaller one. Lotzi Baba says you can do this starting off with any crappy regular graph gamma, perhaps having no non-trivial automorphisms, blow it up to a cover, and this bigger graph that you construct is two arc transitive. Amazing. So Baba decided that this meant that the two arc transitive graphs was a totally wild class. There was never going to be any way that you could systematically look at them or study them because you couldn't sort of reduce down to smaller ones in a, in a nice way. But like, I didn't even know about this construction of Babai's. It's got a really weird title for his paper. Um, and he told me about it after he heard me talk um, at a conference in 1993. So that's a long way after. So what was happening in between was that I was studying two arc transitive graphs because they had been very important families of graphs um, for lots of different reasons leading up to Diggs's work and Hutt's work um, and Richard Wise's work. But let me tell you what I was doing. So for simplicity, I'll say that I'm not looking at a bipartite graph. So my graph is not one where you can just split the vertices into two halves with all the edges going between it, no internal vertices. So I took one of these two arc transitive non-bipartite graphs. And I said, okay, is there a non-trivial normal subgroup which is intransitive? So it's the graph's not bipartite, so it's going to have at least three orbits. And I formed what, what I called a quotient graph, a normal quotient graph. So the definition of the normal quotient graph was that the 
new vertices where the n orbits and I join to if there's at least one edge between the n orbits. So this time I'm showing you the same picture, but we're thinking that my, my graph is the one at the top and, and the blue circles are now the orbits of my normal subgroup n. And I'm constructing the quotient, which is the one at the bottom. And so every n orbit becomes a vertex in the smaller graph. And if I've got some edges, at least one edge between two blue circles, I'll put an edge in the quotient. So that gives me my normal quotient. Now, what I proved was that the big graph was a cover of the quotient. Cool. And I also proved that the quotient group G modulo N is an autom subgroup of automorphisms of this quotient and it's transitive on two arcs. So that this wasn't just any old cover because Babai had these crazy covers. But if I take one of these normal covers of a two arc transitive graph, I'll end up with a smaller two arc transitive graph. And so then the thing was, if I choose my normal subgroup N to be as large as possible, but still be non-transitive, intransitive, then this new group G mod N is going to be quasi primitive, which was interesting. I had tried very hard to get a reduction to primitive cases, and I couldn't. I could not get a reduction for two arc transitive graphs to ones where the, the automorphism group was primitive on vertices. But instead, this was giving me a reduction to ones where the group was quasi primitive. Only problem was nobody knew anything about quasi primitive permutation groups. The name had been given 20 years earlier. So here I'm doing this about 1990-ish, but there was no theory. So I turned around and developed the theory of, you know, the Onan Scott theory. And I um, applied it in the two-arc transitive case. And I, and I showed that only half of the quasi-primitive types in this sort of Onan Scott theory for quasi-primitive groups, only half of the types could be possible for automorphism groups of two arc transitive graphs. So it was kind of useful. It was satisfying that it sort of worked. Um, it was pretty useful. Like um, Sasha Ivanov and I were able to classify all of the quasi primitive affine examples. And it's been used by other people to construct new families. And this normal quotient method is now a pretty standard method for analyzing all sorts of families of edge transitive graphs. So that was successful, but it's funny. Uh, I felt kind of disappointed at the beginning because I was finding my, um, my application method was not getting me close to where I could use the finite simple group classification. So let me talk through a couple of other things that we might try to do, the sorts of problems we might look at, the sorts of tools we might use. So here's another, another set where, where we're actually using group factorizations. And again, I'm going to talk you through it via um, an application in graph theory. So you take a graph, gamma, it's got vertex set V, edge set E, take A to be its full automorphism group. And let's suppose A is transitive on ordered pairs of, of vertices which are joined by an edge, so on the arcs. Some people are very interested in embedding graphs onto surfaces. They might be interested in what's called a regular embedding. And when they do this, they want um, a subgroup of the automorphism group of the graph to be, to be sort of acting as homeomorphisms of the, of the surface. And they would like this subgroup to be transitive on flags, on incident, vertex, edge, face, triples. And in order for this to happen, or this happens, well, well, let's just say, in order for this to happen, you need a factorization of the automorphism group as G times, at least G times the stabilizer in A of a vertex V. And G intersect AV, that is the stabilizer of the vertex inside of G, has to be dihedral. So factorizations with special properties. Um, another problem, 
suppose you ask whether gamma is a Cayley graph. So Cayley graphs are graphs where you identify the vertex set with the elements of a group and the right multiplications by that group elements are automorphisms of the graph. So gamma is a Cayley graph and Babai and Godsill um, said for a long time it's been known this happens if and only if there exists a subgroup of automorphisms which is regular on vertices. And now this is regular in the group theory sense, transitive with trivial stabilizer. So in this case, this will happen if the automorphism group A has a factorization, G times AV, where this time the intersection of the two factors is trivial. So there's heaps of work on factorization problems of groups, which are, and they, the problems have many, many applications. And um, here I've talked about applications in, in graph theory, but there's also many applications in algebra. Another area of factor of, of applications, and just try to talk about the sorts of things about permutation groups we care about here, is in number theory. Um, look up Bob Gurelnik's name and you'll find lots and lots of our papers about this. The groups that come up are usually Galois groups of field extensions and there's many very deep results. Here is a theme, um, derangements. So derangements are fixed point free permutations. These come up very often and group coverings. And I'll talk about that in a minute. These are different sorts of group theoretic problems that arise. So derangements, fixed point free permutations. There's this paper dating way back to 1981, just after the classification was announced. Authors Fine, Cantor, Shaka, theorem that it proves every transitive permutation group contains a derangement of prime order. Now, some of you might think that you know this result. Um, every transitive permutation group contains a fixed point free element. That's a very, very old, 100 year old result. But in all, and, and that has a very elementary proof and it's, well, it, many papers written about that. But to have a derangement of prime order, their proof and the only known proof requires a finite simple group classification. Pullman and Goralnik take this a whole lot further and they've proved that if you take any transitive representation of any finite simple group, then the proportion of elements of the group, which are derangements, is bounded below by a, a positive constant C, totally independent of the simple group and of the representation. Quite surprising and quite useful. Um, group coverings. So what are these and where does the problem come from and what kind of group theory would we need to, to be working with it? So there's some papers um, at the moment, uh, Daniela Bubaloni and pa Pablo Spiga are uh, preparing a, a, a huge monograph to, which I hope will be published sometime soon. But let me just uh, introduce a, a sample um, problem from number theory where where this will arise. So you take a an integer polynomial f of x. You suppose it's got k different irreducible factors, and that all of these factors have got degree bigger than one. And then you um, take the the rationals and adjoin all of the the roots of this polynomial and look at the Galois group of the polynomial. That is the Galois group of the you know, the field extension that you get by adjoining all the roots. Then what happens is that this GOA group is a union, just a set theoretic union of proper subgroups coming from K conjugacy classes of G. And these are in fact, the stabilizers of the roots of F as G is permuting around the roots. So the question is what kind of groups can be represented as unions of certain um, number of conjugacy classes of the group G. So there are many questions that this sort of spawns. You might say most Galois groups are symmetric groups, which is kind of true in a certain way. So you might say for the symmetric group, 
if the, if your um, if your Galois group is S n, um, how small can k be relative to n? And the answer is linear. Or you might be looking at the case where this uh, Galois group is an almost simple group, and then you might be asking all of these questions about coverings of the group by conjugacy classes. How many classes do you need? And these are the questions that Daniela and, and Pablo are trying to answer. So there are many different bits of group theory and permutation group theory that we need to answer lots of these questions. Um, last comments. I'm thinking of, yeah. oops, I should be finishing soon-ish, shouldn't I? Um, There are problems which you would never have thought about. And I want to um, mention one because this is the, the way that a lot of these problems tend to arise these days by you modern young people. Um, yeah. You do a bit of experimentation and, and your experiments will suggest that something's happening that you don't understand. And this is what Pablo Spiga was doing. He was looking at primitive groups and he looked at it computationally and he did a lot of deep thought. And a question that he asked when he came visiting us in Perth once was, if you have a primitive group G, when is it the case that every element of G has at least one cycle of maximum possible length, of length, the order of the group or of the element? So a regular cycle is a cycle of length G. So supposing that G had order six, um, you, you, you are asking when is it the case that you've got a six cycle and that G isn't made up just of two cycles and three cycles? Seemed a crazy thing. No one had ever asked this sort of question. But there are two papers, 2016 and 2017, of Pablo, who was the orchestrator of this problem, he guessed it and he guessed the answer. Um, there's one paper of Pablo and Simon Guest and another paper of Pablo and Michael Judici and myself. And the answer is, this is always the case unless omega is of the shape um, gamma to the R and the group G has a normal subgroup alternating group to the R contained in symmetric group with SR, where the SM action on gamma is on, um, not R sets, <laughs> is on K sets of, of subsets of one up to M. So I found this incredible. I didn't even believe him when we started proving it, but um, this is a sort of question that just might come up and you might, you might be lucky enough to find something that you really don't know um, whether it makes sense or not. But uh, I, I would like to say that computational and combinatorial evidence followed up by new investigations is a really great way to, to work as well. So um, I think I'm going to stop and um, wish you all the best and say, please, if you've got any questions, please ask them for me. I've given my slides in and I've made a few um, notes on just a couple of the um, the, paper, the things that I've talked about. So I think perhaps I'll stop and say, have you got any questions? Oh, I should be moderating. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear anything. <laughs> So how does she hear? Now I have to go to the front. Yeah. I can I can also repeat questions if necessary. Okay, yeah. because she can hear you. Absolutely. So uh, Sharon, can you hear me? So if I repeat questions, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Rebecca. And you can hear me sort of if I speak loud. Is that Donna? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cheryl. It was a beautiful talk. That's why I didn't rush off here because I was sitting there being amazed. Anyway, so now we have time for questions, which is nice. Are there questions from the audience about any particular aspect? And if I went too fast, please tell me where to um, wind the, the file back to. Questions? <laughs> 
No, I had a question, but I didn't write it down because I was busy reading and listening, but it was sort of way back. Um, maybe if you back up through, I find where the question was. No, not that fast. <laughs> fast. Um, let's see. Uh, it's more, let's see. It's arrangement. It was before. Okay. Me. Forwards now. Is it before it this? Covering. Wait a second. I think it was on the covering groups page. That is, that the, is that That's the first one? So this was the derangements page. And that's was the there, covering groups page. Was there covering groups before that, though? Um, no. No. Maybe I didn't say enough. It was covering graphs. <laughs> the covering graphs, that's what it was. Maybe that was. Oh, covering graphs. Yes. Yeah, maybe that's my question. Yeah. Yes. So oh, the my, first one of yeah. making the. So my question was here. Um, yeah, my question was about this, that you know that somehow because of this, this general thing that you can always find a covering graph, you can start with some completely random thing and then you get some mm. covering graph that has a nice property. So then you said, bye bye, I said, well, okay, so this means that two arc transitive graphs are wild. But then afterwards you did this other thing. So now yes. that it's paid. So, so he, would, he was starting with a, with a crappy graph and making a very, um, cluey, very smart kind of cover. Mm -hmm. And instead, I started with a nice graph, and I, which was like his bottom one. I, I don't know what it was. Um, but I wasn't doing the sort of um, arbitrary, you know, if you've got a graph and, it's, and you know it's a cover, then you can look at the quotient. Mm -hmm. But here I'm saying, no, I'm only, you shouldn't, take arbitrary quotients you should just take special ones wow. so the, f the first thing that you might think of doing with a graph is to take your nice graph take your group and say is it primitive and the answer is no because there is um, an invariant partition of the vertex set and so that will give you these blue circles your invariant partition um, your graph's connected say um, so you'll have edges between them, but you, you won't necessarily have nice matchings between these nice blue circles. Um, so my, my definition of quotient was uh, in the quotient, you put an edge if there was at least one edge up here in the original graph. And um, if I did this with an arbitrary G invariant partition to form my blue circles, I couldn't prove anything nice. And I asked myself the question, was it possible to have a, a two arc transitive graph gamma with a nice group G so acting two arc transitively, preserves a partition and between two adjacent blue blobs, there's just one vertex joined to one other vertex and the other blob and all of the other vertices, they don't have any edges between them at all. There's just like one edge, one edge. I mean, <laughs> the, the quotient is not going to be too arc transitive, but I didn't know whether it was even possible to have something as, street, as extreme as that. And then when I was working with some PhD students later on, Feng Xingui found an infinite family of examples where that actually happened for the, I think it was the Suzuki groups, so that you could not try to get a, a primitive group acting on a quotient because you would lose all the symmetry you cared about. And so if, you're, if your application is in graphs and you have a certain kind of symmetry that you want to study, you, there are certain things you're not allowed to do because whenever you make a reduction, you want to retain the symmetry that you care about. <laughs> so, so, so for these um, two arc transitive graphs, it, I think it really is only the normal quotients that give you a way of squashing the graph down to the smaller one at the bottom and I'm sorry I didn't rename these things here the smaller one at the bottom which is the normal quotient and still have it being too arc transitive mm -hmm. and when I did this normal quotient I would never would never get guaranteed primitive only guaranteed quasi-primitive 
Okay, that, yeah, that was my question. That was, that yeah. was what I did. Are there, yeah, no one, yeah, yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, I also have a question. So you explained to us how you came across quasi-primitive groups and also the problems that motivated it and how you then started to develop the theory of quasi-primitive groups and it helped you answer the original question. But then can you tell us a little bit about how the theory of quasi-primitive groups went on from there? Because that was probably not the end. Right? No, so, so if I go back to um, some of these answers, uh, dot, dot, dot. yes, what about quasi-primitive groups here? Um, there were, um there was this idea that quasi primitive could be as um as viable a basic type of group as the primitive group so the the primitive groups sit inside the quasi primitive group so there's more quasi primitive than primitive and um there are many many um old theorems about primitive groups so one of the things that happened was Anne Shalev said okay you're, you're doing all this stuff about quasi-primitive groups. What theorems about primitive groups have equivalence for quasi-primitive groups? So that's one of the things that we looked at. And we, um, we, we published a paper where we gave equivalence for a lot of different problems about or results about primitive groups, which held in a certain way for quasi-primitive. And, and this one here about this um, density of degrees, um, this had this hinged on a theorem that said um, that the density of indices of subgroups of finite simple groups, apart from the alternating groups, has density zero. So maybe if I say that, so if you take all, all of the possible non-abelian simple groups, leave out the alternating groups, and then take all subgroups of all those finite simple groups and note down what all the what the indices are and then tra trace them out on the number line you will get you will get a set of density zero which i find incredible and yeah. and what the cameron neumann teague result really relied on was that statement where we only took the maximal subgroups of the simple groups Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's sort of mind-boggling. <laughs> yes, but this statement about density zero is for all subgroups. Not yeah, for all subgroups. Not um, and and the and the primitive one was for just doing the maximal subgroups. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I mean, it's it's a it's a more um, mm, attractive result than just saying density zero. You you work out what the leading terms are, and um, and for the primitive groups there, numbers which are squares, numbers which are triangle numbers, numbers which are primes, numbers which are prime plus one. And there are equivalents for that, for the quasi-primitive case, except there's slightly more of them and we needed to know what their density was. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Are there questions? Yes, Melissa. Um, so maybe my question has to be repeated, but um, in the results by Fulman and Gorelick on the proportion of derangements in transitive groups, um, Cheryl said that there was a, it, um, the proportion was bounded below by some constant C. Is it known what that C is? Like, is that an actual Ooh. Um, um, Gosh, it ought to be, oughtn't it? And I don't know what the answer is. But, okay. the, but because these results are spread over a few paper, a few papers. So I'll have to take that as a question on notice and have a look because I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else knows the answer to the question. Perhaps they do. Scott, do you know? I think it is known and I think it's a very, very small explicit number. Oh, it is known. Okay. Scott thinks it's known. Scott, yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's, it's sort of along the same lines as the first question is about graph coverings. So you've got these two procedures, one where you start with a graph and you produce uh, a two arc transitive covering, and there's the reverse process, your normal quotient process. 
I'm wondering to what extent these processes are dual to one another. So say, for example, you start by producing your two hour transitive cover and then you apply your quotient procedure. I assume you end up back where you started, but like, can you go the other way? So like, are all, like what sorts of graphs can be produced by this quotient procedure? I don't know if that question is. Oh. Did you catch that, Cheryl? I, I, I caught, I, I caught about one third of it. Um, so it's about the process, you're going to take, you're the process, it's about the process of, of building cover or coming back and whether they're kind of dual to each other. So the, the process of looking at the sorts of um, normal quotients you get and then see whether you can reconstruct the graphs. Yes. Is that it or? or... Yes. yes, that's it. Will that's you it. recover? Okay. So, so that's a really, that's a much tougher problem. And there are um, quite a number of papers, not very many by me, not many at all, um, where, where this reconstruction question is is studied and you need a bit more because of course when you're making a normal quotient you're forgetting a lot of information and so in order to reconstruct um, you you need to work out where to put the edges and uh, and you've got this n this normal subgroup n which is acting actually I didn't say it here but when you do this normal cover and you get the quote um, say the two arc transitive across a primitive group, the N itself is acting semi-regularly. So each of these blue blobs is like a copy of the group N. And so you need, it, so each blue blob looks like a copy of the group N. You have to work out where to draw the lines. And there's a theory about that, which is a bit sort of co-homological. Um, and I think they talk about them as being voltage graphs or something telling you, how, how to how to define the edges um, there are papers about this by a lot of slovenian um, group theorists graph theorists and uh, and so there is a theory i don't work in it and but it certainly does not have a, a, a complete answer thank you. Okay, thank you. like you might do it if n is an elementary abelian group or cyclic group or something like that it might be known Other questions? No, it seems not. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>